It is hard to fathom today the amount of economic activity that was happening in this city 110, 120 years ago. The first huge change in Detroit came in 1825 with the opening of the Erie Canal. All this stuff wound up coming down the Great Lakes, passing right through Detroit. So Detroit became a major hub of, of, of trade and, and shipping. With the advent of the automobile age, which came roughly in the 1890s, that heavy metal machinery background in Detroit morphed into the, the early stages of the automotive industry. Coming up into the 19-teens, into the 20s, uh, Detroit became fully industrialized as cars, the Model T, you know, people could afford the Model T. It just exploded. And so people who were interested in making cars began coming to Detroit. And that, that was the first huge economic engine for Detroit in the 20th century. But that whole movement with the original uh, mass production at the Henry Ford Highland Park plant was duplicated all across Metro Detroit. And each of those was an economic ecosystem in and of itself. So you had all the part suppliers nearby. And then from there, just a whole community of workers. And then all of the services that serve those workers. Mansions were built, skyscrapers were built, uh, fortunes were made, the Fords, the Manugians. It is really the, the period uh, uh, under which Detroit becomes a major industrial hub. Uh, it's a point at which Detroit becomes uh, America's fourth largest city. Uh, and it's a point at which um, the African American community uh, began to uh, move to Detroit, mainly from the South um, to Detroit, uh, in the period that we call the Great Migration, uh, beginning in the 19 teens. Folks, African Americans in the South were in economic distress, um, post Civil War sharecropping society cultures, as, as poorly paying as it was, uh, kind of dissolved. And there was a massive spike in lynchings. So there was uh, economic deprivation and fear of death and, and jobs waiting for them in the North. Whether it be African Americans in the South, whether it be people from, from the Eastern Bloc in, in Europe, um, they all came here because it was a Goldilocks era where you could make a lot of money, relatively speaking, with no education. You have to imagine that uh, 100, 110 years ago there were lots of car companies. Uh, and uh, over time, there was consolidation in the industry, so they all basically formed into the General Motors and the Ford and, and the, the Fiat Chrysler that we know today. Um, but those plants were built in, by today's standards, very unfavorable settings for an auto plant. They literally assembled one part of the body uh, at one plant and then put them on trucks and finished the assembly uh, a, a mile away. And it was just tremendously inefficient. On top of all that, you had urban pressures that were beginning to uh, build. By 1920, uh, the Urban League estimated that a thousand African Americans were moving to Detroit uh, each month. And so Detroit's black population rises from 5,700 in 1910 to 120,000 by 1930. The challenge was for African Americans is that there were very few places um, where they could live. Even though Detroit is a northern city, uh, it's a very segregated city. It was then, it is now, it remains that way. The middle class African Americans began trying to buy houses in neighborhoods around the city, and they were met with great resistance. Probably the, 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 the most seminal uh, moment in the 1920s, at least as it re uh, relates to race relations, was the Ossian Sweet uh, incident. Um, Dr. Ossian Sweet was a medical physician uh, an African-American who moved into an all-white neighborhood. A white mob tried to force a doctor named Ossian Sweet out of his house. Uh, they, Sweet and some friends knew they were coming. They armed themselves around the house. Um, frictions got high, emotions got high. And a white man uh, is fatally shot uh, from a bullet that came from uh, the Sweet home. Two trials were, were carried out in 1925 and 1926. Ultimately, uh, the Sweet family uh, was, was acquitted. But it was, it's an indication of how tense this, this was. The African American population doubled from about uh, uh, 150,000 in 1940 to about 300,000 by 1950. On June 20th, 1943, uh, it's a very warm day, uh, about 90 degrees in Detroit. It happened to be a Sunday evening, it was Father's Day evening, um, but an altercation uh, begins between whites and blacks. Mm -hmm. 
in the black neighborhood, the rumors were that you know a white mob had thrown a woman and her baby off the bridge or something like that. And in the white neighborhoods, the white bars and nightclubs, um, the story was that the blacks had committed some atrocity. And so the fighting on the bridge spread downtown, uh, people who weren't even related to this thing. And the riots just spread from there. Over a three-day period, uh, 34 people were killed, uh, most of them blacks. Really, in 1943, it was white people, uh, some whites, obviously, um, having open season on African Americans. The 67 Rebellion, some people believe that that was um, a byproduct of years of oppression um, by the police. So to hear a shooting for those days, and to see soldiers and tanks on Mack Avenue was something like you never seen before. And it was African Americans essentially rebelling against the oppressive conditions they were living in, uh, the economic uh, disadvantages, uh, the racism, the segregation. And they targeted the police because the police were seen kind of as the, the enforcement arm of the white establishment. That was actually, to me, the destruction of our neighborhood because after that, it was never built back up. Racial tensions spiked. Um, people had started moving to the suburbs. Obviously, we know, we know the term white flight. That happened. This was the epicenter of white flight. Um, and the problem with that was the automotive plants that were in the city started moving to the suburbs, um, basically abandoning the community in Detroit. The population peaked at about 1.84, 1.85 million in 1950. It began declining steadily after that. Uh, and it declined even further after the 67 riot, but the riot didn't cause it. It was just sort of an accelerant to, to what was already happening. But what it did do is it, it drained uh, some of these neighborhoods of businesses. And you know, without businesses, there's not much of an economy, and things began to really you know, sort of more self-deteriorate at that point. We tend to think about white flight uh, in Detroit uh, occurring after the 1967 rebellion, um, but, but Mayor uh, Edward Jeffries in 1944 lobbied Congress, uh, the federal government, to, to secure monies to build uh, expressways leading out of Detroit into suburbs. Those failed policies by white men really set the seed uh, for what you saw happen to Detroit in 2013. Would we rather have a new plant in a crowded urban area where it's going to take you <laughs> a half an hour to get a truck from uh, uh, an urban location onto, onto a freeway, or are you going to put it out in the suburbs where the freeway are, already exists? I believe in the 50s um, there were 10 or 15 new automotive plants built, all in the suburbs, none in the city of Detroit. Um, <clears throat> so that growth really happened in Detroit in the suburbs, and that has been the case for 60-some years. The companies maintained a presence in Detroit, but they were no longer you know, the thing for Detroit. Um, and as that happened, you know, a single industry economy, and when it begins to abandon where it is, you know, Detroit just it kind of stopped being the motor city. Everything snowballed at, at that moment, uh, the effects of the air, uh, oil embargo, the rise of the Japanese, uh, the in-your-face reminder that uh, this trio of U.S. companies uh, was not necessarily going to be unthreatened for, for the rest of time. You also had a rise in crime uh, in Detroit uh, in the 70s, and that was probably in large part to um, you know, the economic challenges that a lot of people in the city face. And so that really sets off um, a chain of events for, for city government to re respond to, right? Um, how do we bring in more revenue when people are leaving the city? Not just white flight, but certainly by the 1970s, black middle class flight. And so a city that at one time had uh, 1.8 million people is now down to just over one and a half million people by 1973. And then by 1980, only 1.1 million people. By the year 2000, there are far fewer than a million people that live in the city. Um, and that, again, was a, had a tremendous uh, um, drain on the city's, uh, city's resources and the ability to provide basic public services. We begin in Detroit, Michigan, at one time, the fourth most populated city in the country and one of the wealthiest. 
Well, it's now becoming the largest city in American history to file for bankruptcy. This has been absolutely devastating. This is a city that personifies urban blight. They're going to have to put together a plan. I think there is still a question about what's going to happen with those pensions. So the bankruptcy happened in 2013, um, a run-up of decades of mismanagement. Um, obviously, the financial crisis harmed pensions. Uh, so they had a $350 plus million dollar budget deficit, um, as well as $18 billion in long-term debt. You know, I mean, the, the city for years had been taking in a billion in revenue and spending a billion too, and kept borrowing to make the difference until they ran into the legal borrowing limit, and uh, uh, the city ended up in bankruptcy. One of the untold stories, I think, of the bankruptcy is the extent to which the period immediately leading up to it, the, the three or four or five years leading up to it, essentially set the framework for the bankruptcy to be effective. Because you don't want to go into a bankruptcy, clean out all your debts, and then find that you don't have enough to work with so that you just slide right back into bankruptcy. The problem with the city getting to bankruptcy was the problems with uh, revenue. It was a declining city. Places that have a single uh, dominant industry, especially one that's based on consumers. Um, tend to feel the pain a lot more deeply than other than diversified places. And when financing dried up and people weren't able to get uh, the loans they needed to buy cars, uh, the, the auto industry tanked right along with that. So the city filed the Chapter 9 bankruptcy protection, uh, largest municipal bankruptcy in the history of the United States. When Judge Rosen said that he needed $800 million to solve the bankruptcy. I just thought there is no way we can assemble that kind of money that quickly. But you had two major foundations located here or who had high interest here, the Ford Foundation and Kresge. And the two foundations agreed that we would put the first money on the table. And if we put enough money on the table, we felt that we would sort of start in motion uh, the willingness of others to do the same. So although 800, 850 million dollars is a huge number, when you get 8, 10, 12 different folks contributing to that, um, it's doable. And so I think what you saw in the first year or two after the bankruptcy was Mayor Duggan really going to work on the basics. When I got elected, we needed to put on 500 lights a week to get neighborhoods lit. We had to buy new ambulances, we had to buy new buses, we had to train bus drivers. But ultimately you need a quality of life that makes people uh, have a reason to stay in Detroit or to come to Detroit. How do we improve the city and, and, and not um, revisit um, the same failed policies? 2008 to 2013, we began a rail system, we did land use planning for the first time, we created a small business fund that began the engine of small business development, uh, we began school reform efforts. It was the demolition of the abandoned houses. Uh, we've been taking down a hundred vacant houses a week and when you take out the burned out houses, we had a lot of vacant houses that are beautiful brick houses people walked away from when they were underwater in their mortgage. We started auctioning them on our own website, now we auction four houses every day and we've now moved 4,000 families into houses that were vacant four years ago. The city receives um, something called hardest hit funds which are which are federal dollars and it's using those to tear down some of the tens of thousands of blighted properties that were tallied in 2014. So we own just over 95,000 um, structures and lots and all of those were abandoned in some way, shape, or form before we got them. That's nearly a quarter of all parcels in the city. Detroit's problem is it's so huge, and there's just not that many people anymore. So what do you do with all these swaths of land where there's just, you know, polka dots of houses, you know, and just fields and forests? It's a real challenge. So in 2014, under this new administration and post-bankruptcy, uh, the land bank became the place where all residential, publicly owned, whether it was tax foreclosed or had been abandoned for years, years and years, um, was transferred to the land bank to actually come up with a strategy to push that property back into productive use. In the past eight years or so, uh, gentrification has gone to the downtown area, and that marks a radical change for Detroit. It's a welcome change. Um, it's a limited change, given the scope of the problem. Uh, it's 140 square miles of a city, and this is um, a handful of square miles of the downtown area. A couple of years ago, I was uh, pretty much in the Cass Corridor uh, b between Wayne State and downtown, uh, and there's a real bustling area along Cass, and it looked like a Woody Allen movie. 
there were all white people. There were no black people. <laughs> For the first time in my life, growing up as a Detroiter and being an African American, I was like, that's not my city, is it? <laughs> there's a huge divide between the neighborhoods and downtown Detroit. Um, there's a narrative called Two Detroits, which the mayor of Detroit, Mike Duggan, hates to hear. Um, but a lot of people believe it's true. You go into the Midtown area, uh, it's heavily white in a heavily black city. What happens in the areas outside of the, the 7.2 square miles, the, the, the broader general greater downtown area? The job's not done until you get those neighborhoods restored and that is incredibly complicated because you're talking about an entire generation of people who don't have the skills, uh, as far as we can tell, to, to survive in a modern economy. I believe 38 percent of the jobs in the city require um, a degree of some kind, uh, which is relatively high. Uh, even for most major cities, it's a pretty high number. Um, and the problem is, is that we have an education system that is failing. Uh, Detroit schools are a failure. It's hard to understate how important that is and how critical that is for the livelihood of the city and the future of the city as these people uh, get out into the world. You know, and the real big issue is that, so for instance, 71% of the jobs in the city are held by people that live in the suburbs that look like me, um, largely a white population. The automotive industry is still the driver of, of, of the Metro Detroit economy. We don't have the assembly plants that we used to have before. Um, uh, it's more of a white collar office, research and develop, engineer kind of, kind of, kind of thing now than it was a, a labor thing before. The automotive industry has spiked so well back up. Uh, like I said, 15 and 16 were U.S. automotive sale records. Um, they haven't seen profits like these in, in, in the history of, of the automotive sector. Um, but the issue is we're still 250,000 jobs short of what we were in 2000. It's not going to be one strategy that brings the economy of Detroit back. It's going to be a mix of strategies, and we're trying to pursue all of them. I mean, you got to have the cooperation of everybody who lives and works in this area. you got to have investment from outsiders. Um, it's a real uh, balancing act. I mean, it's a real dance you got to do. If it was easy, they would have solved it already. <laughs> I mean, it's so hard to figure out. And it's heartbreaking now to drive down uh, the streets um, that I grew up on. I tossed the football on it. Uh, you know, communities where I went to school, to grade school. Uh, tragedy uh, in terms of uh, vacant houses, people who were victims of the foreclosure crisis. Uh, it is not a comeback city uh, into those communities experience a renaissance. Hey NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.